drawing is part of learning science. And they go into several reasons why that is the case. Drawing helps to uh, explicate our thinking, to make us think about what we're thinking about, to show relations. It helps to identify misconceptions. And so it's absolutely critical. What, what CogSketch is, is an intelligent tutoring system that tries to take advantage of these properties of spatial reasoning. There's been tremendous progress in intelligent tutoring systems in general. The Pittsburgh Science Learning Center is sort of founded upon this principle. There's tutors in algebra, tutors in geometry, and now several other topics. Um, but what there hasn't been until now is a spatially based tutor because of the inherent uh, difficulty of capturing and analyzing spatial relations, and that's what CogSketch is intended to do. So, for example, um, when we're trying to teach p students to think about the circulatory system or the properties of geological processes that create mountains, how did Sugarloaf come to be is a process of geological education, and sketching is absolutely critical to geological process. We know it's critical. Um, and that's why teachers have people do paper sketches. But paper sketches are limited for multiple reasons. One of the most important reasons is it's very hard to give feedback in real time. Students often report that they'll sketch as part of their learning or their homework, and they won't get responses back for weeks, in part because it just takes time to score. So what if we could have a computer-based artificial intelligence system that captured that and provided feedback in almost real time. It could dramatically alter the teaching and learning of science. And importantly now, uh, the hardware for doing this has become affordable. This was sort of a bet of Cox Sketch when we first started now almost 10 years ago uh, with the great help of the National Science Foundation. These were, tablets were rare and very expensive. Now there's probably 100 out in the audience right now. Um, they have reached the point that everyday education can afford them. But what we don't have and what CogSketch provides is the software that really takes advantage of the affordances of the tablet computers. You point and move things around and think rapidly about relations. And now what CogSketch tries to do is to take advantage of that for science education. So here's an example of how you might interact with CogSketch. You draw an object and then you label it. And that's very, very important. It's within a particular domain. We have cog sketch for geology, cog sketch for learning about the circulatory system. And this, the fact that you label it, so in this case, the student is asked, is this the crust of the earth or the inner core or lava or what part? So it makes suggestions because it knows something about the domain, but it does not require visual recognition. This is a huge stumbling block in vision AI research and in using sketching in education is this recognition problem. It's extremely difficult to get computers to recognize objects. I mean, there's been some success on it. But CogSketch bypasses this problem by having the student label it, just as we do in the back of the napkin. You often label it. This is this, and this is this. And this just does that naturally and gets around the problem of visual recognition. It has 58,000 concepts for many different domains. Uh, and it, it suggests relevant ones. So it kind of thinks about what you're thinking about and makes relevant suggestions. So it doesn't have to guess from an infinite number of unconstrained possibilities. Uh, it has specific suggestion, uh, uh, suggestions. And here is an example of its use in teaching a geological concept. Uh, the students, one of, one of the most important early things in, in um, geology is to learn about how forces affected the rocks that we see. Structural geology is basically explaining how these structures came to be over massive amounts of time and the forces that influence them. And different rocks fold or break in different rate ways. You can have faults, which is where the rock has actually cracked, and that can be the cause of earthquake. Or you can have folds where it bends but does not break. And those structures look very different, but there's an expertise in seeing them right away. Um, and CogSketch asks the, draw, asks the student to indicate the fold and the fault in this drawing. And you can see it does it, and then it pre presents feedback, instructing the student to draw a line along the major fracture plane. And if they make a mistake, it also suggests alternatives. So um, the student gets feedback in real time. 
So it's solving the problem of visual recognition by having students label it. That allows us to give it the right amount of knowledge about the relevant domain and give, it, give the student the feedback that they need to take advantage of sketching. Here's a, another example of a study that Benji and I and several others did about use, uh, comparing expert and novice geologists in how they sketch. So here's the original figure, and we simply asked them to capture this. This is a, a cycle showing the relationship of, of magma and how it goes above the earth and how um, faults and earthquakes and volcanoes are related. The novice's sketch is in some ways very accurate. Their job is to take this picture and copy it faithfully. What they don't have, though, is the scientific understanding of how these processes relate. So, for example, in some ways, the experts doesn't capture all the detail, but it does capture the scientifically relevant parts. And this is how Cog Sketch can be used not only as a tool for education, but also as a tool for understanding the nature of, of spatial expertise. Worksheets, and particularly as implemented in Cog Sketch, are therefore a form of formative assessment. And people are asking, like, what have we learned from all the um, cognitive science and learning science as it applies to education? Well, here's one thing we can say with great certainty. Formative assessment works. Formative assessment means giving feedback as the student is learning. Most of us are familiar with the opposite, which is summative assessment, where you get feedback only at the end. My daughter takes a test in Illinois in March or April, and I learn in October, after she's already moved on to another grade, what she learned and didn't learn. It has no influence on anything except as to whether the school gets money or not. It doesn't help in learning in any way. In contrast, the formative assessment gives real-time feedback and allows the teacher and students to adjust their learning as uh, misconceptions are revealed or as progress is made. And so formative assessments um, are at least 50% more powerful than summative assessments. And they're one of the top five uh, learning tools that we have in terms of the magnitude of effect sizes. And CogSketch allows us to have spatially based formative assessments in many different domains now. We're developing this for ranging from middle school science to college level engineering and sort of finding places where sketching is absolutely critical. S professors or teachers agree that it's critical and that they can see the advantage of doing this and it seems to help the student. So sketch understanding is a central problem in spatial learning. The hardware for doing it is now abundant and affordable. But what we need is the software that takes full advantage of those affordances of tablet PCs and iPads. And so therefore, the cognitive, uh, cog sketch is promising for influencing how people teach and learn. Now for the second part of the second educational technology and approach that we're using is the geospatial semester. This is in cooperation with Bob Colvert, who's the Dean of Engineering at James Madison University, a large state university in Virginia in the United States. Um, and what we are doing here is taking a spatially based approach to um, reform in science education. At least in the United States, there's great interest in changing science education from being about learning a set of facts, like the heart has four chambers, to learning the process of science, to learning key skills and practices that scientists do, asking questions, analyzing, interpreting data, constructing explanations and designing solutions, engaging in argument from evidence, obtaining, evaluating, communication information. Those who have come up with the next generation science standards strongly emphasize that science is not only a collection of facts, but a series of practices. And Colbert and I and others are taking a spatial approach to trying to promote this. So uh, there's a great deal of interest in improving spatial thinking. A lot of it, and I've done some of it myself, is in these basic core spatial skills like being able to turn something over in your head. And that's really important and, and we should do it. But there's a second important approach which is to embed or as Nora and others have argued, spatialize the curriculum to make engineering or science education more spatially based. All of these problems of constructing alternate energy or high speed trains or understanding climate change that led a hurricane to hit Brazil uh, for the first time in recorded history a, a few years ago. Uh, climate change is real for all of us and these patterns and their change is inherently spatial. So we're trying to educate people to think about modern, complex, real world problems in a spatial way. So, and our main tool for doing this is geographic information systems or, or GIS. 
And these have been around for a while. What's new is their sort of fluent use in education. And GIS, in contrast to being a static map, GIS allows you to focus on different aspects and to represent them however you wanted. So for example, if you were planning where to build a new business, you might want different kinds of information, such as how the land is used, the elevations, how it's divided into parcels, streets, and where the potential customers might be. And you can simultaneously take away or add these different layers. And so part of problem solving then is finding the right data and representing it the right way. And when we put these two together, the solution often emerges. And we're trying to teach students to do that. So the geospatial curriculum is a high school senior elective. It now has a well-specified scope and sequence that, you know, it's published, teachers can, um, can get it and implement it. The software for doing it now is very cheap or even free. And it emphasizes problem solving and problem finding. You have to think about data, you have to think about the real constraints of the real world and find ways to solve it. So my question as I partnered with the, the developers of this is, is it working and how? Not only are, children, are students better at something like mental rotation, but do they also think differently now? Do they think more spatially as a result of this curriculum? And the question then is, how do we know? It's, you can't just give them one test and claim these things, so we really want to look at the process. And we have several converging measures. One is the quality of the final projects. The second semester is devoted to this real-world project, which they then present as a poster. And uh, we, can, we have um, rubrics for assessing that. We also use uh, measures of the spatial language that they use when communicating their findings. So we give them interviews, and the way they talk about their projects and the problems they found and tried to solve can indicate something about how they're thinking. And we also have them do what we call transfer problems, where we ask them to think about things that they weren't taught and see if they apply spatial, spatial uh, approaches to that. Okay, here's one example of a final project just presented in May at James Madison University. Uh, many of you have probably heard about Google and other uh, large companies' attempts to provide uh, internet access to those in underpopulated or overpopulated but underserved areas uh, that may not have access and it involves some kind of drone or balloon or something. And so this student said, well, where would we go with that? Where's the best place to invest and how would we do it? And so he, began, he, he created different layers of different aspects of the solution. He said, where is the internet available in Africa? That's one layer. Uh, where is there political instability? If there's political instability, we can't count on the system being maintained or accepted. That's, you know, he's, he's thinking both like an engineer and a businessman. He wants to make the best, most likely successful investment. So politically unstable places aren't going to be the first place to start. So he came up with an index of terrorist uh, threat level. Then he puts this all together, thinks mathematically about the optimal places that he should start, and he identifies Namibia and Botswana. And then with that, he, he's, he's, he's taken an evidence-based approach to identifying these areas as the likely target. Then he constructs the optimal path for these drones to fly and give the internet. So he's solving a real-world problem that has both engineering and economic aspects, uh, and really thinking deeply about what the problem involves and solving it. Here's another one sort of more locally. This, uh, this was done in a local uh, rural high school near Shenandoah National Park. One of the problems they have is that bears come out of the park and into people's backyards. This is not good for the bear or for the person. And so they have to come up with a solution. Where do we put these bears back so this won't keep happening? It turns out that's not that easy of a problem because you have multiple constraints. You can't just put the bear in the back of your Toyota or something. You have to have a truck that's big enough, and, but that means you have to have roads that are big enough. So the student worked with different kinds of data and represented it and actually made recommendations that the park rangers have adapted, adopted to um, suggest where the bear should be returned. So let me show you the transfer questions. Uh, these are questions where the answer could be spatial. These are not part of the curriculum. We're asking, has it affected how they've learned? And the question I'd like to emphasize today is the, 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 what we call the campaign question. If you were uh, running for a local office, such as sheriff, how would you go about getting your, the word out? Uh, so here's, this is a student from who's in the uh, GIS class. Could you?
Notice his gesture, which is another aspect of the coding. He is very much thinking this as a map problem. It, it is one that can be solved by mapping. And let's look, and here's the transcript. I would think about it as a GIS. I'd do a map. I'd find the data. You can see all these aspects of modern science education and reform in what he's saying. Let's quickly look at the uh, control condition. So her approach is not bad. It's to um, recruit the support of local businesses and sort of start a grassroots campaign, but it's not spatial. She never, almost never moves her hand, and when she does, it's just to make a point. She sits on her hands mostly. There are very few spatial words in what she describes. So this is one bit of evidence that we think that we're actually creating um, a difference in how students solve problems. I won't have time to present all the evidence for that, but we do have evidence based on the spatial words that they say that uh, the GIS does change how people think, and you can ask me more about that during the question session. Um, so uh, the, it promotes a spatially based approach to problem solving. It improves spatial reasoning. And drawing and mapping and GIS promote the kind of spatial uh, scientific reform that NSF discusses. So thank you um, to our funders, and uh, it's particularly the NSF and the many collaborators.